Nation. Every pony, I'm Master Code, your ace analyst, and today, in preparation for issue number 96 of the main series, we'll be taking a brief break from season 10 to discuss the MLP movie prequel comics. As the name implies, this four issue series sets up the backstories of the many supporting characters from the My Little Pony movie. And while I may reference the movie here and there, that will be a topic for another day. Suffice it to say, the movie was. okay. So, do the prequels fare better than the movie? Does the knowledge of this miniseries help see the movie in a better light? Well, kinda, sorta, not really. Uh, okay, enough of my musings. Let's put some ace analysis on these movie prequels and see where the comic shows promise and where things go wrong. Starting off with issue number one, we have the Storm King monologuing and breaking the fourth wall over how amazing and ruthless he is in his conquest of the world. In the movie, honestly, he was a horribly underutilized villain. That's not to say that he didn't have potential, as he wasn't just the mwahaha evil villain. They attempted to have the audience like him by making him very eccentric, switching from laid back to suddenly over the top anger or other odd expressions. It's the magic of. Yeah, yeah! Friendship and flowers and ponies and boo! And while there were some effective humor scenes here and there, the problem is we didn't really get to see him that much. And he's basically just the shadowy overlord giving his troops marching orders. We see Tempest power and domination over the equestrians, making her the much more interesting and intimidating villain. And we're just told or see the aftermath of what the Storm King has done. I don't want to get too far into the movie, so back to the comics. Here, he's still his eccentric self, and admittedly, he has a few good moments. And on top of that, we do actually see him and his troops conquer Abysnia, which lends more credence to him being a more threatening baddie. The problem is, he's not a great villain and he wants wealth to fuel his war machine. The most basic, uninspired motives for a villain. And of all the characters who really needed an interesting backstory, it was this guy. Making him more complex by giving him a valid or personal reason for wanting to conquer the world. Maybe his own nation was conquered and in anger, he decided to attack the weaker nation of Equestria. And he finds solace from grief in his eccentric mannerisms. Something that makes this guy more fascinating and relatable and unfortunately, he's just not. Anyway, the comics also introduced the Storm King's second-in-command, who was not present in the movie, this amorphous, smoky blob of a creature named Strife. He mostly just plays the begrudging cohort, but is ultimately a superfluous character, and I'll tell you why in a bit. I will say, though, I do like his overall design with the unsettling, creepy, dark cloud vapor shaped to resemble a misshapen skull. It's kinda cool. Also, just to get this out of the way, just like in the movie, Grubber's also entirely pointless. Jumping ahead to issue number two, Captain Silano and her pirate gang successfully pillage another one of the Storm King's haulers. A fun little quirk I did like about the pirates was how every crew member had some missing element of their body, whether it be a limb, an eye or mouth? It was just a nice little touch that made the design stand out a little more, as there really wasn't too much to their characters other than they look cool and they could fight. We get some dialogue between Silano and Mullet, and though we really don't get too much out of them, it is nice to hear about their pirate life as we can identify and connect with how much they are struggling to stay afloat with such meager catches. And with the events later on in this comic, it does set up why in the movie Silano and the others would eventually join the Storm King's fleet to maintain their survival. Later that night, after some more monologue by the Storm King, Captain Silano's pirates attack his fleet and steal his haul from Abysnia, and it is revealed that Strife has betrayed him. He stole my balloons! I guess this was an attempt to set up that the Storm King hates friendship being betrayed by his most trusted cohort, but it really doesn't add anything as, again, his conquest was solely for the control of the world, not because friendship was flawed. That was Tempest's story. It feels like a tacked on element along with Strife, as shortly after the Storm King catches up to them and he immediately gives him the Hank Scorpio treatment. Get the hell out of here! <laughs> And going back to my point on why Strife was completely unnecessary, I could have bought that Silano's gang just happened upon the Storm King's fleet and stole his hull without Strife informing them. And the guy is never seen again after this point. So yeah, bye Strife. Thanks for 
being there. Speaking of superfluous elements, the Misfortune Malachite, a cursed artifact that ultimately brings ruin to any in its presence. Because of its shape and color, I initially assumed that they were the stoning grenades Tempest used in her initial attack on Cantalot, which would have set up where she acquired such mystical objects. But no, it's a MacGuffin for this miniseries only. Between these sequences of events, we catch up with Capper and his best friend Schumer, who sneak aboard one of the King's haulers, escaping the ensuing conflict between the King and Cylano's pirates. Issue number three begins with their airship crashing due to the Misfortune Malachite, and this is literally the only time in this arc that it really ever comes into play in the story. Moving on, compared to the last two stories, Capper's is actually given a little more attention and intrigue. We find out that Capper and his friend were orphans, becoming pickpockets and growing their thievery skills as they grew up. These scenes not only show why Capper in the movie is so suave and streetwise, but also does flesh out his character. Along with that, I do like the camaraderie between the two throughout this comic. They poke fun at each other, but they also have some fun, meaningful talks about their future and what's best for both. After everything that's gone down over the past couple days, Capper's looking at his life and seeing how he got where he was. He realizes that being a thief all his life can weigh you down. Whether it be for the rush or necessity, it's a hard life to live. He wants out and just wants to be free and live a normal life. However, with what happens later, it does make sense for him to continue this life as seen in the movie. The two try to sell the Malachi to the big crime boss in town, Verko, in exchange for their own airship. However, when the deal goes down, Chumer flips out and steals the airship, leaving Capper behind, nearly killing the dude by pushing his best friend off the edge of the flying airship. It comes completely out of left field, with him claiming that with all the talk of Capper saying he no longer wants to be a thief, that somehow means that they can't be friends anymore? I get what the comic was going for to match his character in the movie, but it just feels artificial because, like I said, it comes out of nowhere and the writers just needed a reason to make Capper Capper hate the idea of friendship. For two friends who we've seen so close for years to suddenly break it off over one talk just feels unnatural. Maybe if there was a scene of Capper taking the moral high ground on stealing something in town, directly showing Schumer that he is losing his edge, maybe then I could buy this material, but as it is, it doesn't really work. Moving on to issue number four, we now follow Tempest Shadow's journey, where she also comes across the misfortune Malachites, along with the burning wreckage of Schumer's destroyed ship. The final issue, for the most part, is the mayor on the run from the Storm King and his Forces, but I will say, Tempest Story is also the one that's executed the best, in terms of transition from the comic to the movie. Long after her encounter with the Ursa Minor, she's still mostly her cold, loner self, but still does possess some levels of humanity. In her travels, she runs into a pony named Rambler, and they connect rather quickly to the point where she's able to open up to him, showing that she still has elements of kindness and compassion within her. Later, when the Storm King ambushes her, he tempts her with the promise of being able to fix her broken horn. Earlier, she attempts to access the magic of the Malachite, in the hopes that it would possibly fix her, but it only released echoes of the past, warning of its dangers. Thus, when that failed, it makes sense for her to fall for his lies and join him. She's traveled harsh landscapes all over the world since she was a young filly, searching for an answer to heal herself once and for all. And since the Storm King is literally the first solid lead to her path to become whole again, it makes sense for her to obey his every order to achieve her goal, even if it means attacking the rulers of Equestria themselves. A daunting and insane endeavor, but she realized this may be her only and last choice, and she takes it. Oh, and one last thing, the Malachite is just destroyed by the Storm King and is never seen again. So yeah, other than that instance of crashing Chumer and Kappa's ship, it had no effect on the plot at all. You could have literally just attributed their ship's accidents to mechanical or other problems and you would have had the same effect. So yeah, the MacGuffin was utterly pointless. And that was the MLP prequel movie arc. Like the movie, it was... okay. There's nothing inherently bad about it. I never found myself getting angry or frustrated, but there was just so many superfluous elements like the Malachite and Strife and other questionable aspects that just leave you wondering what was the point? I like Tempest and Capper's stories for the most part as it actually expanded upon their characters and the bonds they formed along the way. It felt organic and interesting. Would I recommend these comics? Only if you're interested in seeing what the supporting characters were up to before the movie. Again, it's not bad, but you can tell this miniseries was severely handicapped to corroborate with the events of the movie. Well, that's it for today, guys. Until next time, and see you!